talk a little bit about uh, the core registration program that we've been uh, running at Blue Corner and um, some of the ways we've started to bring in recreational divers and dive instructors and opportunities for divers to get involved and how possibly if um, there's dive instructors or dive operators here that want to set up their own project, um, can listen about the step-by-step -step process that we went through for setting up a restoration project. Um, so at Blue Corner, um, we've got a conservation organization as well as our recreational diving organization. Uh, the conservation team, we focus on educational programs, uh, research and um, training scholarships for Indonesian students, uh, coral restoration and reef health monitoring. Um, so this talk today is going to be about figuring out what divers can do to get involved with coral restoration, why it's important. I think uh, we already know that the marine uh, environment has a lot of um, I, reefs are in trouble. So how we as divers, dive instructors, dive uh, shop managers can actually get people involved in restoration and sort of uh, changing the narrative on destruction of coral reef uh, ecosystems. So first, uh, looking at dive centers, we'll go through a bit of a case study of um, what Asset Blue Corner Dive have done to set up a coral restoration project and see if it's sort of applicable in other areas. So um, our coral res main coral restoration site is located in Nusa Penida, which is uh, in the, um, at the bottom of the uh, Indonesian through flow in the center of Indonesia. Uh, so it's a really popular tourism uh, destination um, and it's also really ecologically important because of uh, strong currents coming through really healthy uh, coral reefs. Uh, however, there is quite a lot of degradation that's taking place and a need for uh, changing the structure. So, uh, our main restoration uh, project is um, at Centel Reef here, and this is what it looked like um, for the years leading up to 2018. Uh, so, we were doing reef health monitoring on that area for about six years prior to starting coral restoration. Um, some of you in the, uh, in the audience may have been involved in that. Uh, and so uh, this photo is taken in 2018 of uh, what the area looks like. So uh, causes of destruction, anchors dragging, possible dynamite fishing, fishing nets dragging, um, so general uh, physical damage to the reef structure of what used to be coral reef but there clearly no longer is. So what we wanted to do is take this area that had been degraded where there was broken structure to the reef and somehow uh, improve the reef health and bring it back to a healthy state. So uh, in order to do that, we needed some sort of target reference community that we could um, look at and figure out, okay, what is, what is the current state? What is the target we're trying to get to? And what are the steps we can take to get it from that, in it, um, from that current state to that target community? And the step-by-step -step framework that we're going to set up that restoration plan for. Um, so, in our initial site um, assessments in, uh, of the area, we can see that the area, you can, uh, lots of broken coral, lots of um, uh, skeletons from previously what we would think would have been a healthy reef based on adjacent areas that weren't damaged. Um, uh, however, uh, with the currents, with um, the uh, the ecosystem there, there's not going to be any natural recruitment that takes place because if you're a small coral polyp looking for a place to settle, if you're settling into these rubble areas, they're just going to smother and not be able to grow. Uh, you need some sort of stable substrate to grow on there. So what we needed to figure out is then how do we take that um, current state and bring it back to a healthy state. First step is obviously trying to reduce some of those impacts that were causing the destruction in the first place. So uh, these are all photos that we took right around that area. So anchors dragging, smashing out the, um, the reef. Um, and it's not just the anchor itself, but then if their boat is left there overnight, it sways one direction in the current, the chain sways the other direction, and you get this sort of path of destruction and breaking the reef. That's actually a dive boat um, that is uh, smashing out the reef there. So, uh, Fishing nets dragging across as well, causing physical damage to the reef. So all of these and um, pontoons with uh, clearing areas underneath there for their divers or their guests to walk around on. Um, but what happens then is you get these uh, these rubble areas that formed, and the rubble is then shifting down, sliding down the slope, and kind of landsliding and covering uh, healthy areas of reef. Um, so what might have started one year as a 10 meter by 10 meter patch of rubble then keeps expanding out and then becomes maybe 20 meters by 20 meters the following year as it just breaks um, the na natural healthy living reef beside it. 
All right, so steps that we wanted to put together then is we had to figure out how do we actually uh, restore the structure of the reef, or reduce the erosion, recreate some sort of structure, and then bring back the biological components. So the corals, the sponges, the fish, all of those sort of biological aspects of the um, reef. And then um, as it starts coming together, then uh, forming a healthy ecosystem, hopefully, uh, we can start doing monitoring, maintenance, and follow that recovery trajectory to make sure that it is actually uh, becoming a healthy system. So, we'll um, start by st uh, the structural components. Um, after our site assessment, you saw the videos of what it looked like. We had to figure out how are we going to reduce the erosion, provide some sort of stable substrate for these corals to transplant on, um, and increase the topography, or so the habitat for fish and animals to come and live at. So in order to do that, we had to go through a bit of a decision-making tree, because there's obviously not one solution that's going to fix every a degraded coral reef site, right? Every environment has specific depth, specific coral, uh, like um, currents, environmental parameters that are going to dictate what we're able to use at the area. So in terms of re recreating that structure of the reef, uh, we had to figure out, okay, what structures are going to provide the function of topographical relief, reduce the erosion, um, be able to withstand those environmental conditions. We have quite strong currents in the particular site we were looking at as well as materials that we're able to um, source on a small island and um, builders that we have available there and also the budget. We are self-funding from our dive shop. We're not getting these massive grants that um, some of the Saudi Arabian companies or other organizations have. So um, it's something that works on a small budget that we can also get volunteer divers. We can get uh, guests to come and help us with. So that's a big constraint. And the logistics of using dive boats to get out to the area. So those were the sort of parameters that create um, the decision tree of how we were going to figure out what structures to use to restore that degraded area. Um, so these are some of the environmental conditions that we are dealing with. So strong currents, that rubble that's sort of moving. So we wanted to reduce the erosion so it's not shifting that rubble onto healthy areas of, of reef. Uh, so one method we used was rolling out um, uh, sort of roofing mesh uh, and page wire fencing. So we uh, did some experiments with different gauges of metal to try and stabilize some of that uh, movement of the rubble and also encourage uh, natural uh, binding of my soft coral sponges, those sort of things to actually start binding that rubble so it's not shifting and moving so much. Um, additional things that we, uh, so yeah, using mesh was one of the um, methods of stabilizing the area. We also wanted to create a bit of structure. So uh, this is the area of reef we were trying to restore. It was a bit um, overwhelming at first when we started um, doing restoration, figuring out what are we going to do in this area. Uh, so we uh, we also started using some of the structures that um, you, most people are probably familiar with, Mars frames, different types of frames. We, we experimented with different designs to figure out which is going to be best on the reef flat, the reef slope, and different uh, deeper areas. We had such a huge rubble area that went for 300 meters by 25 meters wide that Initially, we're like, okay, well, let's just scatter these frames randomly and try and get as much coverage as possible. So that was one method that we tried. Um, we obviously set up a few experiments trying different methods. Uh, it worked quite well, so then a year later, we keep on adding a few more frames, transplanting some of those um, corals onto it. Um, and then, yeah, as the years go on, the corals are expanding. So it's not just the structures themselves that where our transplants are growing upon, but then by staggering those structures, we were able to actually get the rubble to sort of um, slow down its movement across the rubble field and start piling up new recruits to the area, some of the soft corals, the sponges, some of those other species coming into the area and actually promoting self-recovery of the neighboring areas around and get those, some of those corridors coming through. Um, so now at the site, um, some of the original areas of the site, now as we've, um, the corals on the in initial frames have expanded out and started connecting with one another, we get a little bit of topographical complexity, different types of um, habitats, so some heterogeneity of habitat there. Uh, lots of different species that are coming into the area beyond just our initial transplants, so beyond just what we transplanted ourselves. So that's with the random scattering method that we tried. Uh, we also tried doing, okay, let's do a methodical sort of um, very scientific method of 
placing them in rows and um, running out mesh between and um, creating a little bit of structure that way and we're able to increase our coverage quite quickly by doing large plant outs uh, which was quite good um, and it actually it worked quite well because it created these sort of terraces on some of the steep, steeper slopes that trap the rubble coming through um, one of the caveats for when we were doing a large plant out at the same time is then you, we do get a little bit of most of the corals being the same um, age whereas when we were randomly scattering you're getting a lot more uh, differences in age class and whatnot so it's going to attract different um, fish species and organi uh, organisms coming in. Um, so that's the structural sort of um, decision making we went through. Then we had to figure out, okay, well, um, we're recreating the structure of the reef, but now we also not need to figure out which corals are we going to bring into the area, right? We're not just like planting pretty corals. We wanted to actually have some scientific validity. Uh, so by doing that, we want to look at our reference community. So what, what corals are growing in adjacent healthy reefs at the same depth, the same exposure, those kind of things. Um, and figure out what proportion of different acropores, different coral species are there, and then use that as sort of a template of what we can bring into our restoration site. Um, so transplanting corals onto frames themselves, because um, as I mentioned earlier, it's hard to transplant directly into rubble because it's just going to shift and get smothered, so we need some sort of stable structure. We, use, we chose these particular metal structures, some coated, some non-coated, because they were easy and easily available, but I'm not promoting one method over another. I'm just saying this is the decision-making uh, tree that we went through to choose for this particular site. Uh, we also uh, used some rope bird nurseries, so ways that we could increase coverage um, quite rapidly across some of these rubble areas. So uh, those of you who are familiar with Nusa Penida and Lebongan, there's a lot of seaweed farming that takes place, and the seaweed farmers um, do this with their um, by uh, putting out stakes and ropes in between and growing seaweed. So uh, we mimic that um, in the coral realm and we did uh, created these sort of gardens which then as the um, they start out as nursery and then as the coral grows it just becomes this carpet or blanket um, of acropora in this particular case we've done it with a few different species as a way of increasing coverage quite quickly in some of those larger rubble areas uh, so some of the monitoring now that we've been going at this particular site for about seven years um, seeing um, yeah, just tracking the recovery trajectory. So we knew what it looked like initially and what our target community was. Um, so then hopefully as we're doing the monitoring, that's the state we're getting to. But uh, we obviously need to do it scientifically and methodically and track it to make sure that that's what's happening. So we do, uh, we get students involved in um, coming out and data collection so that they can actually participate with the dive shop and see, do fish counts, do um, uh, quadrat surveys, do rolling out tape measures to help our um, scientists collect this data. We found uh, that it's obvious significant decrease in rubble and then increase in hard coral. Then if we were to overlay soft coral sponges and all of those other substrates in there, we'd um, have quite a high percent coverage of living substrate that we've found over the years. Um, so, yeah, some individual uh, frame coral monitoring that um, by doing some uh, microfragmentation and different other methods that have been kind of fun to play around with. Uh, and then recently, this video is just from yesterday, I just added it in. Um, so we've got some sharks that have just moved into our restoration site. So those frame design that we did, uh, initially was to, the reason we designed them was to stabilize the rubble and uh, allow rubble to stop shifting down that slope. But the secondary benefit is it's been a nice habitat for uh, fish species, some of those animals to come in because it does create that coverage and we've had a white tip mama that clearly gave birth to four pups uh, recently in January and they, they were so cute. They started out like this big and now they're about an arm's length and there's four of them. Uh, we thought that there was just two but two of them must have been hiding in a neighboring frame we didn't see because yesterday we found that there actually is four. Um, Made, Putu, Komang and Kutut. <laughs> Um, we're also doing some uh, all sorts of research projects that we try and get students from different universities um, involved in as well as get our guests involved in uh, so 
Emma here. Um, she was doing a research project looking at uh, sound on the reef. So we put out hydrophones in healthy reef, in rubble area, and then also at some of different age areas of our restoration site just to see what the sound of the reef was and you see if that we could use that as a way of tracking the success of the restoration project. Uh, and we've got a new restoration project started now um, with uh, partnerships with some other organizations and the Snorkel Boat um, Association in Le Mans and that's, um, there's some impacted areas there. So we're helping them with their permitting, their uh, restoration plan, the structures they're gonna use and the training for their, um, for their personnel so that they can start their own projects. So one of the main things that um, we've started doing is helping um, other dive shops and conservation organizations uh, train their staff and help them set up their own coral restoration projects so that they are able to figure out rather than just like planting corals and getting selfies for their guests um, is to actually make sure it's, it follows a scientific protocol and that um, it's specific to the environmental conditions that they're operating because obviously the conditions we're operating in Panita may be different than the conditions in North Bali or different areas. Uh, so we focused on uh, providing staff training programs in both um, with our Indonesian marine biologists and English, um, so in multiple languages, and assist with project setup. Uh, getting dive, so by then setting up the coral restoration project, it's been really uh, helpful for getting divers involved in how um, how they can help uh, with us. So because we've got this sort of scientifically valid, uh, continuously running a restoration project going, people can feel like they're part of, and if they're just diving for one day with us, they see our full-time marine biologist going out and transplanting coral, they can take part in it and know that they're part of a bigger sort of picture, they can see the, what the area looked like before and after, and it's actually really fulfilling for a lot of guests that come out and participate in these projects with us. Um, we run workshops, training workshops, as well as um, three-week programs for uh, university students or just people who are interested in marine ecology, uh, as well as research programs as well. Uh, so we're in booth F9, so come see us if you're interested in those sort of programs. And then from the dive instructor point of view as well, um, so uh, we've started running a coral restoration uh, instructor uh, program so that to train instructors, to take out divers and do sort of a two-day introduction to restoration with their divers. So um, in different jurisdictions, you may or may not be able to legally participate in restoration, um, but, it's a, but dive instructors are really instrumental in being able to get people involved in um, restoration. So even observing restoration sites, talking about it, it's something that dive instructors are able to do. Um, so if you're interested in that specialty course, you can chat about that too. So, um, that's our restoration project. I know it was kind of a brief overview. Some of you have seen it before. Some of you have been out there and um, seen it. And there's also going to be a panel in about five minutes on coral restoration on the tech stage over there if anyone's interested.